All right. Welcome to the Sales After Dark live stream. Thank you, Victor Antonio, your host. You know who I am. Holy buckets, I got a lot of comments up here, man. Let me see if I can get somebody down here. Now, if you're watching this on the replay, fast forward five minutes because I have to say hi to my Sales After Dark family. I have had people, I've had people actually complain about the five minute timer and then the five minute intro. So again, if you're watching this, fast forward. It's really simple, fast forward. All right, who's in the house? Inkle John is chiming in, number one from the Philippines, the value merchant man himself. Oh, Las Vegas is in the house with Brian Gator, man. Jamaica, Leon Daly, man. Thank you for joining me, man. So glad to be in the live session. Cheryl, you are welcome. You're a champ, champion. Shrutesh, go down has set the timer. Hey, man, welcome, man. Uh, we got Sam Amber, love it, man. Uh, hi from there, from there. Jonah World, hello, back at you, man. Jonah, where are you from, man? I don't think I've seen your uh, name here before, man. Jonah World, is that your real last name, brother? Is that your real last name? Because it's a cool last name. Uh, good morning from Asia. Chris OBS Business, man. Uh, what's the OBS stand for, man? Let me know, man. Hello from uh, Montreal, love it, man. Up north. I'm here from the great state of mind. <laughs> nice one, Herb. Nice one. My girl, Mia Knox from Los Angeles. Always glad to have you here. Cam Les, Savant, the Savant, the intelligent one. Oh, man, this one. Yashvardhan Patil. Did I get it? Hey, right back at you. Where are you from? Let me know. Let me know. Leon says, best podcast, man. I'm with you on that. I think it's pretty good, man. So let's see what we got here. We got Casey Richie says, Amy, she copied a bunch of people. Way to go, Casey. Way to go, Casey. I like you already. Uh, we got... Sam Amber sends, Brian Morell, this is for you, man. How can I join in B2B SaaS sales? I have experience in data science and machine learning and academia. Dude, you are in demand, Sam. So, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't worry too much about that. So, Shrutesh again, 6.30 a.m. in India. I appreciate you, Shrutesh. I really do, man, because I know it's hard to get up early. Keep it up, VA. I'll catch you on the playback. Hey, man, any way you can catch me is a good thing, Jim. So... Harman Bra, hello from Brampton, Canada. I'm a network marketer and a big fan of Victor Antonio. Finding the why in how people buy. You got it, brother, man. I love that. Damn, thank you very much, man. Hello, always a pleasure. Carol Parker, thank you for joining me. We got BB, Brenda, Bella. Hey, love, your lives. I like you already, Bella. I like you already, La Bella. And then the man himself, Luigi. Giovanetti. Love the title of tonight's session, man. I think it'll be interesting, man. It'll be, uh, let's see where we go with this. Arvin Garcia, hi from the Philippines. Man, you're the guy that always asks me the tough questions, Arvin. I'm watching you, man, so be gentle tonight, man. Good afternoon from California. Sparrow's Tales back. Brenda, hello from Toronto. Omar Mahmoud from Egypt. Uh, or or got in the house. I like that. The big DL, Doug Lehman from the ATL. You know that whole thing, right? So anyway, Doug's a good guy, man. Uh, Omar again, how to sell durable masks, uh, B2B, love it, man, we'll get to that. What up from Houston, Texas, happy Sunday, Courtney G. All right, man, last one here, and we're going to, Rod, had to be here, man. All we're missing is Victor the Man Tan, so love it, sales after dark, rather brings Victor sales light in the dark. Dude, you're awesome, man. So, hey, so let me just jump into the subject, I think we did that about less than five minutes, but anyway, man, it's hot in the studio here. So I want to talk about, I read this article by a guy named James Mankey, and it talked about, you know, seven ways to sell in the new normal. And so I kind of took what he had and I kind of adjusted it, but I'm getting credit and I'll make sure I'll put a link to the article. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put that in the actual description. So again, if you're watching on Facebook, welcome. If you're watching on Twitch, welcome. If you're watching on my different Facebook pages, fan page or personal page, Welcome. Anyway, so let's talk about this new normal because we're still going through this, right? I was, I was looking at some numbers yesterday and obviously the, uh, you know, the infection rate continues to go up because they're doing more testing, but the death rate seems to, you know, as a percentage of seems to be going down. So that's a good news. But, you know, what's the number where you kick this off? And I've come to the conclusion, I was having a discussion with my wife this morning about this and we're talking about, you know, the reality. So my wife and I have this routine where we get up in the morning and we typically talk for about a good half hour to an hour, you know, in my office, have coffee, just sip, chill with little dog pebbles. And so, you know, when this pandemic hit in March, I was coming off of a, a road trip for three months. I was on the road and I came off the road and I remember I had just done a, 
a week-long stint in Puerto Rico. Boricuas in the house. My family's from there. And so when I come back about a week later, you know, the shutdown here in the United States. And I remember telling my wife, I said, I think we're done for the rest of the year, you know, because I think they're going to cancel everything. And sure enough, after that, the cancellations began to roll in, right? And so I lost like big cash, right? And so like anybody, like everybody else, you have to pivot, right? And so I pivoted. I went more online, did stuff like this. I do webinars. I do online uh, courses. I do coaching, stuff like that. And it's actually working out pretty damn good. Uh, so I'm actually thinking, maybe I don't want to get back on the road anymore because this is too good staying at home all the time. But what's interesting is I told myself, you know, July 1st will be the day I measure. I told myself, I always put a stake out in the future when I want to. So I don't keep thinking about something every day. I'll just say, you know what? Come July 1st, this is in March. Come July 1st, let's measure the temperature and see where we're at. And so July 1st rolls around, I'm going, man, I, I really think we're done for the rest of the year. So this morning, this is like, again, today's what, the 22nd, 23rd, whatever it is. Um, and I'm thinking that 2021, I think we're done for the first six years, six months rather. Do you know what I mean? I think it's going to be very difficult. Now, when I say for who, I think obviously some businesses are really just blowing up right now, right? Like the... Um, uh, the, the pool industry, which I've talked about, uh, is growing uh, gangbusters. Anything that has to do with home, believe it or not, home repairs, home investment is going just through the roof. Uh, there was another thing we were talking about, like uh, patio furniture, any type of furniture for outdoor stuff, through the roof. That stuff's going. Um, and so there's some businesses that are actually just benefiting. Netflix, obviously, Zoom, obviously. And, but there's a lot of companies that are just hurting and struggling. And all you need to do is drive around your neighborhood, man, to see that some of these businesses are closing down. And I don't think they're coming back. I really don't. I, I've seen a lot of furniture places closing down. Um, office furniture is doing really good, by the way. Uh, so like, you know, the Office Depot and places like that, you know, some of their business is really going through the roof. So I'm thinking we're done for the next six months into the next year, 2021. And so by, by done, I mean, I think it's, gonna, it's not going to get easier. I think uh, my wife said it best. She said, I think people are going to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Right, like PTSD, just like you know, soldiers when they come back from combat, they suffer all this trauma, and I think we're, we're going to suffer this trauma, and that trauma is—it's going to be a while before we get back to this. This no, I don't think we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to this uh, this semi-normal, and I always use this example. It's the analogy I used. Tell me what you think of this analogy, but. Uh, for those of you who know, I have an engineering background, and one of my classes I had to take was a metallurgy class, study metals, right? And I remember the instructor gave us a hanger, you know, a wire hanger. And so, you know, he gave us the wire hanger. It looks something like that, obviously. That's the hanger, right? And then he said, he grabbed it. He said, grab it right here, Vic. He said, grab it right here. And then he just said, bend it right here. He said, just bend it right there, right? And so you bent the hanger, right? And then after you bend it, he said, bend it back to how it was. And obviously, when I tried to bend it back, this is what I got, right? That's what I got. You couldn't bend it. If you bent a, a metal hanger, you know what I'm talking about. And that was his way of teaching us something. He says, what happens is when you've actually bent the hanger, you've actually, here's the word he used, it, it's, called, it's called you've deformed the electron bonds inside the actual hanger. Now, just bear with me. Don't, don't, don't go away yet. Don't, I'm not going to bore you to death with this stuff. Just, this, makes, this will make sense. So what happens is you can't get rid of that bend, but obviously the bonds there become much stronger, which is why if you think about these two corners of the actual hanger, they're very strong. If you think about bumpers in a car, the reason they bend them is because where they're bent, the bonds realign and form a stronger bond, which means you'll never get the kink out. You'll just never get the kink out, right? And so what I think has happened in this economy is they bent the hanger. That even if we try to go back to normal, we're just not gonna be able to go back to normal. It's just not gonna work. And so I think we need to start thinking about it that way, that we're not going to go back to normal. And if we're not going to go back to normal, if we're not going back to normal, you know, we need to figure out how we're going to sell in this environment and then maybe put a plan together. So as I was reading this article, I said, you know, this will be a cool topic to cover because I don't see a lot of people talking about it. And there's nothing in here that I'm going to share with you that's earth shattering. Okay, there's nothing I'm like, oh my God, it's nothing like that. But they're great reminders of how we should approach business and how we can get more business if we just follow these seven principles. Again, the article was written by a guy named James Menke. I'll put the link in YouTube, the description, and let's get to it. Let's go to the first one. The first one was actually a simple one. The first one was, you know, acknowledge when you're talking to your customers, acknowledge the, that, again, that they're more budget conscious. Like, say to your customer, I understand that right now you're struggling with a budget. 
And so this part I added. In other words, connect with your client. Do you know what I mean? Really get in there with them. Really get, take their point of view. I've said this many times in my other, uh, as I've had other discussions, like sometimes you just have to get in their mindset, right? You really have to kind of get in their head to understand them. Like what's going on? Take their point of view. And that's what I want you to start thinking about is when you're talking to a customer, let's have those blunt conversations. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're having what I call these meandering conversations. Nobody wants to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. If, if right now you're struggling because you don't have the money, you don't have the budget set aside, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how we can do something together. And I think that's what customers are looking for. They're looking for that honest conversation. The question is, are you brave enough to have an honest conversation with your clients? Even if it's a prospect, somebody who, who hasn't bought from you yet. And I think that's what they want. I think they want an honest conversation. They want you to say something like, look, I realize that right now we're going through this period and you're probably struggling with budget. But I also know that we have to continue to grow. We have to figure out. So our job is to what? Reduce that risk. First, connect with them, right? Let them understand that we understand that what they're struggling with, that the money is tight. The situation's a little precarious right now. And, you know, if you've seen my past uh, podcast, you know that I always believe that if your selling comes down to this, there's certainty, there's certainty on this side, and on that side we have anxiety. That's it. If a customer is feeling an equal amount of certainty or anxiety, they're not going to make a decision. If they're feeling a lot of anxiety, they're definitely not going to make a, you know, a decision, right? Too much anxiety. So our job is to what? Is to increase their certainty, or if we can't increase their certainty because we don't know what's going to happen, is there a way of reducing their anxiety? Is there a way for you to put something together for them? And we'll talk about what can you do to reduce that anxiety that they're having. But I believe that the first step is to have that honest conversation. So look, your company's struggling, our company's struggling too. Here's what we're going through. What are you going through? And then have that dialogue. That's what I mean by the connection piece. On the second part, if I can clear this real quick. On this one, what I'll say is the second part is highlight how your product can be an asset now and in the future. This is where you have to increase their certainty. People are willing to invest. Now, keep this in mind. People are willing to invest. You're, there's customers out there who are willing to invest. Right now, people are buying. Okay, so it's a matter of can you frame the conversation so people will actually buy? And again, how can you position the asset in the future? We know things are going to turn around. And so this one, I'm going to say, how can you give them more courage? Because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for you to give them more courage. It's the weirdest thing. Listen to me. This is interesting. I'm telling you, I, I got coaching clients right now. And as I'm talking to them, what I'm realizing that in many cases, it's not so much the strategy, the business plan the go-to-market plans. It isn't that so much as they need the courage. They need me to just, t I guess, talk them off the ledge. That look, we have to make some decisions. We have to be a little bold here. Markets change, got that. Conditions not right, got that. But somebody's always making money. The flow of money never stops. The flow of money never stops. It can slow down. But somewhere in your business, somebody's making money. And what we need to do is convince our customers how our products can help them now and in the future. And I think that's where you reduce some of the anxiety. So how can you give your clients some courage, man? How can you help them say, look, this is going to help you in the long run. And that's what they're looking for, get, uh, for you to do is to come in there and have some type of plan. So the first one was connect with them. I understand where you're coming from. I said, now, number two, now let me show you how this product is going to help you not only today, but tomorrow especially as the markets begin to shift. Now, when I say we're done for this year, again, that's my market, the speaking training business, that's done, right? Because nobody's gonna have big conferences anymore. That was a big a money maker for me. But people were not gonna get into, I mean, can you imagine just try to get into a convention center now, gather a thousand people? Even if the government said tomorrow, okay, everybody can gather tomorrow. Everybody can just do whatever they want for conferences. People are gonna be so stressed out and maybe a little leery that they're not going to show up. So I think it's going to be a while before this all comes back. So much like that, this is how I'm talking to my customers all the time. I'm telling them, look, I get it. It's not going to go back to normal. Isn't that an honest conversation? See, that's the part one, the connect. Let's have an honest conversation. It's not going to go back to normal. Done. Guaranteed it's not going back to normal. Now you know it, I know it, we know it. What are we going to do about it? Do we roll over and die or do we figure out a plan? to go forward. And this is what they're looking for, 
for you to have those honest dialogues. And don't be afraid to challenge your customer a little bit. Says, look, it's not coming back. A lot of this business is changing. People right now are changing their market strategies, their business plans, they're pivoting because they realize it's not coming back. And the first thing to do, it's almost like the five stages of grieving. You know, like when somebody dies, there's the five stages of grieving. You ever see, uh, I forgot what her name is. Uh, they created the five stages of grieving. And this is kind of what we're going through right now. A lot of us, if not everybody, all of us really are in the grieving process, but we're at different stages. I, I think it was Kubler-Ross. I think it's the Kubler, it's called the Kubler-Ross model. I think it's Kubler-Ross. If, if I'm wrong, correct me, but I think it's the Kubler-Ross model, right? And it's the grieving model. And it's five stages to grieving. Like when, when somebody dies, you go through five stages. When you get fired, you go through five stages. That's the grieving process. So what's happening is the first one is you're in denial, right? You're in denial. Boom. No way. Can't be happening. Not happening, right? Imagine you're getting fired. You're like, no way. Nobody's, they're not going to fire me. I'm, there's no way they're going to fire me. No way they're going to downsize me. Then the second part is anger. You know, this is when now you've been fired or things in this case, by the way, I'm relating this to what's happening in the market. Now, the new, the normal is dead. You can be in denial right here. Maybe you're still right here saying, no, no, it's coming back. Victor. It's going to be just like it used to be. No, it's not. It's not. And so now once you get past it, now you're, like, you're in anger, like, oh, I put in all this work. I invested so much money. Right. That's the anger piece, right? A little dramatic, but you get the idea. We go through this anger phase like, I can't believe it. No way. Right. You're getting a divorce. You go through the what? There's no way this is happening to me. Then when it does happen, you're what? You're angry that it actually happened. And then because you're trying to save it, you begin what they call the bargaining phase. Right. The bargaining phase is you just bargain rather. You just begin to bargain, right? You're just like, you're like, you know, dear God, you know, please help me. Do you know what I mean? Or you, you start making deals with, you know, the, the Faustian deals. If you do this, if there's a way that you can help me do this, I will do this. If there's any, if you can save me now, now is the time. And I promise that from this day forward, right? I promise that from this day forward, I will save money. I promise that from this day forward, I will do this. This is the, the bargaining phase of death of anything, right? And some people are in this right now. I swear if the market comes back, I'll make sure that I have enough money put in the bank. I'll make sure that I always have a plan B. This is the bargaining phase. Oh, just let the market come back. They're in this phase right now. Bargain. Now, when bargaining doesn't work and nobody's answering your call, right? Then you move into pure depression. That's when you're just like, that's it. That's pure depression right there, man. And a lot of people are in that. And by the way, this is not a linear process. So it isn't like you just go through them like this. There's, you're going to be now anger, bounce back to now, then go down to here. You can bounce back and then, so there's some bouncing around going on. But when you're in the depression mode, depression mode is like, you don't want to get out of bed. The bills are building up, right? You can't pay the bills. You can't pay your workers. You got to lay people off, right? I mean, can you imagine companies who have to lay people off? What they're going through, what they're trying to do, right? That's what they're doing. And so this is what they're going through. They're depressed because they have to do this, right? On the bargaining phase, if you have to lay people off, I said, man, if we can just get a couple more deals, we don't have to do this. But they're still, they go back to denial. But the reality is it's not coming back. So they then they go in depression. And then finally, it's not that you emerge out of the other side, but then there's the acceptance phase. That is the acceptance phase right there. And the acceptance phase is like you just, all right, this is how it's going to be. This is how it's going to be, you know? And that's what I'm trying to get you through. If you're, try, if you're listening to me right now and I'm trying to reach through this camera to, grab, the camera to grab you, this is what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to accelerate your process here to get to there. Because once you come out of acceptance, once you're there, and you go, things have changed. Just like I'm telling you, I knew. March, end of March, year's done. Now I'm thinking, first six months of 2021, that's done too. I've accepted that. It was very quickly to go through this real quick because I go, hmm, it's not coming back. Because once you hit acceptance, you're able to use that magic word. You're able to pivot. And all of a sudden, your brain begins to think of solutions. You ever think about this? This is the coolest thing about acceptance. That once you accept the fact that something's not coming back, that it's not happening again, 
you're not going to get that job back. Your husband or wife is not coming back. The job's not coming back. The business is not coming back. That position, that opportunity, gone, 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 gone. Once you say, mm, you've gone through all this and you're there, then your brain now begins to work on what do we do next? You've already gone through the depression phase, so we've already cried. We've already drank a couple of bottles of wine and some beer, right? We've gone through all that. Once you go through acceptance, it's like this. It's like taking a shower. And, you know, like that. And now you say, okay, now what do we do? And that's what we have to start thinking about. If right now you're an entrepreneur, a small business owner, and you're struggling, and I'm telling you right now, you need to move through this process very quickly and just accept the fact that things have changed. You have to restructure your business and make whatever changes you have to make to get your business going. Now, keep in mind, I'm telling you this because I want to help you, but also keep in mind that this is what your customers are going through. This is exactly what your customers are going through. They're, 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 I mean, a lot of them are still probably right here. Denial and anger, denial and anger. That's what they're doing. They just don't want to admit it. And so I think you need to be sensitive to that. But to keep in mind that what you have to do as a salesperson is try to get them through that. And by the way, not just as a salesperson, as a manager, and just as a plain old human being, right? Just help them. Help them get through these five levels and get through the grieving process. And so if you can help them do that, that'd be great. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, but you got the idea, right? So step number three, let me go to step number three now. Let me clear this. Step number three is, Again, explain how your solution can help reduce risk. Remember, certainty and anxiety, right? Clients feeling a little bit of certainty, a little bit of anxiety. Your job is to increase certainty, reduce anxiety. How are you going to do that? And what people want to feel, if you ever thought about this, what people want to feel, what you're feeling right now, or not feeling, I should say, is a sense of control. Isn't that the fear we all have? Is that we don't have a sense of control. That's what's happening right now. That there, there's this social anxiety right now. And the social anxiety is that nobody feels any sense of control. We're like a leaf in the wind. We're at the mercy of this pandemic and the market forces working, you know, for and against each other. And so what people feel is a lack of control. And so what, the, what we're looking for, what you and I are looking for is more control. But keep in mind, let's be real. Let's keep it 100 that there was never control. You and I have never any control of anything. Nobody does. Now, there exists the illusion of control, right? Which we think we can control things, but we really can't. At the end of the day, we really can't. And so what I think is happening right now is that we feel things anxiety because we don't know what's happening. The customer is feeling the same thing. But if you have a product or solution that you know that could help them a little bit, right? Move them forward a couple of inches. You know, again, just a little bit, give them a little bit of control. That's what they're looking for. So if you, let's say you're selling a marketing program, right? What they want to know is if I give you my money and I implement this marketing strategy, give me some guarantees that I can get in there, right? That can make certain things happen because they want to feel that sense of control, man. That's what they want to feel, man. So I don't know. Does that make sense? I'll take a small break here, man. I don't know if I'm talking too much or I'm just going too fast. Tell me, are you with me one or am I just babbling? Give me a zero. If I'm babbling, give me a zero. If I'm doing one, if you're, if you're digging this, let me know. Ah. Uh. So yeah, I, I think it's really interesting how, you know, we're, we're going to go through this phase and we're going to see that it's going to take a while for us to get back to whatever new normal it is. So I think that's going to be interesting. So again, think of this. <clears throat> Let me know what you think. Thank you for the feedback. There you go. Ah, two. Love a cup of tea. Thank you for joining me. And so let's go to number four. So number four is like, you know, be sensitive to stakeholders concerned about their own professional futures. Yeah, this is a big one. This is a huge one. Listen to me. Benaki, come closer. I said it, right? This, what happens is that people right now, they, they, you got to be, when you're talking, you're selling to somebody. You're talking to a manager. You're talking to a VP. You're talking to a C-level person, a CXO. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. Everybody has bosses. Everybody has bosses. And so you got to understand that what you're asking them to do when they, you're asking them to buy something from you, you've got to think about their professional careers, their insecurities. By the way, one of the biggest paradigm shifts, one of the biggest paradigm shifts that I had in my career in my life, and it, you know, was when I stopped looking at titles. When I stopped paying attention to titles, I connected with people. 
listen to me, man. This is like the, one of the greatest lessons I've learned in business and selling. You could tell me you're a CEO. I just don't give a rip. I don't. I respect the position, but I don't care. You can tell me you're a millionaire, billionaire. It does, nothing to me. Something clicked in my brain years ago that said, never look at the title, look at the individual. And every person you meet, every person, I'll just say this, from the president of the United States all the way down, everybody has their insecurities. Everybody has their, I'll just say their nuances, right? Their anxieties, their uncertainties, they do. And so when you stop looking at people's titles, and, I'm, and I'm, I wanna highlight this because as you're having conversations with clients, don't look at their title. Don't be intimidated by their titles because they're worried about their careers. I can't tell you, and it, it, to me, it, was, it wasn't something that I just woke up when they go, oh, you know what, I shouldn't look at titles. It didn't work that way, I wish it did. But I remember when I first started speaking, years ago I started speaking. By the way, if you want to see something really funny, uh, when I first started speaking back in 92, I think it was, public speaking, I joined Toastmasters. <clears throat> and when I joined Toastmasters, there's an actual video, say, you can actually Google it while you're, while you're watching me on YouTube, just right now, you can, on YouTube, you can go to Victor Antonio's first speech. And you'll see me, I was yeah, a little thinner than that, I, ha I actually had curly hair. But one of the things I learned about speaking was that what you want to do is they tell you, imagine that the audience is naked, right? That's one of the tricks you learn of speaking. <laughs> Look at the audience and they're naked and all of a sudden you laugh at them, right? And that never worked for me. You know, it was too disturbing, right? And then from there, and I'm just being honest with you, how, how my brain just works, right? Because I was like, oh, that doesn't work. And then I had a friend of mine who was a speaker. He said, and this is, I'm not trying to be crude in any way, but here's what he said. He said, Victor, just remember that the people sitting in that audience, just think of them sitting on the toilet. I go, what? He goes, yeah, just think of them sitting on a toilet. He says, he says, there's no more vulnerable position than that. And I was like, <laughs> it was kind of disturbing, but his point was, is that we all sit on the throne, so to speak, right? And what he was trying to say is they're just people. And so fast forward in my career, I had a guy, I, I, I reported to a guy who was a president, like president of a very large company, right? And we did, I did exceptionally well in that company, but about, I met him like, I'm gonna say like five years later, and he lost his position, and he was now like a manager at another company. He couldn't get that level position again, right? And it was interesting, we had, we had a, some beer, you know, you know, conversations over beer, and it was like I was talking to a different person. See, when I talked to him before, he had the CEO title. So he was like, <laughs> all that, you know, the big words that they, they start using. What we need to do is do strategic development in order to execute certain deployment strategies. You know, they talk like that. Uh, and then uh, when I met him and he was now a manager, it was, it was the most interesting, he was like the most humble individual in the world. And, I, you know, he was actually cooler because there was no pretense anymore. And th that was like a big aha moment for me that the title is an illusion, right? Because all those guys that have big titles are insecure about their positions. And that's why I wanna emphasize this. They're insecure about their positions and what they're looking for is a way to be a leader. This is where you gotta convince them that any person you're talking to, again, it could be a CXO, a VP level direct, it doesn't matter. They report to somebody. They always report to somebody, right? And they always have to have something to bring to the table to show companies what they're doing to grow the business during this pandemic. Let me give you an example. If you're trying to sell a SaaS system, I don't care, software system, B2B situation, trying to sell a SaaS system, you're trying to get in to talk to directors and VPs, what you need to convince them of is, one, that you understand that they're taking a risk with your product or service during this time, but you also have to emphasize that they're taking a risk by not taking any action. Your job is to go in there and convince them that your product or service is worth executing on because it's gonna make them look good. Remember, they have to go to their bosses with a plan. They just can't go, well, it's a pandemic, we don't know what to do. No, your job is to help them design a plan. So if you have a product or service that you can sell that can make them look good, and help their professional careers. That's the conversation you have. And don't be afraid to have that conversation. Some of you probably are afraid to have that conversation. I'm not. Because I will, I will literally say to a director, a VP, doesn't matter. I'll say, look, 
Let me tell you how this, if we make this work, if we can execute on this, it's going to help your career, your stock options, blah, whatever it may be. So I know that in my head, I know that's always part of the equation. How do you help people become more successful? So part of your job as selling is not to just sell your product and service and how it can work, but how it can help their career. Keep that in mind. Let me know if you've run into that, where you've actually, you know, people are very insecure. By the way, the opposite does work. When people are very insecure about their position, man, they just clam up. They don't want to make any decisions. So there are people out there like that. I get that. But again, that's a lot of anxiety. Our job is to what? Reduce anxiety, increase that certainty. So anyway, what are you guys saying down here? Uh, on the, it's critical clients are in the survival mode. Yeah, number four, it is critical. They're in survival mode. And, but again, when we're talking to them, Brian, it's a great point you're bringing up because they are in survival mode. I get that. And let me bring up Brian's comment because I, I like it. Because it's critical, you know, clients are in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, there's two things. You can either, remember, I, it's one of those things you can run, you can flee, you can freeze, right? You do nothing right? Or you can execute. And I think a lot of companies are in the freeze mode. They don't want to do anything. They, they don't know whether to go left or right. They're un, un, uncertain. But isn't that an opportunity though? If they're insecure about which way to go, isn't that an opportunity for us to go in and have that conversation with them? But if you go in there and you're hesitant and you're scared, then why would they want to buy from you? Because they're already scared themselves. So, uh, you know, it's good. I agree with you, Brian, 100%. I think they're, they're in that mode. And, man, you know, I get it, man. So, let me see. Shrew Test said, I was born in 1992. Thank you for making me feel old, Shrew Test. I thought we were friends. Apparently not. Just kidding, man. Anyway, uh, let me see. Uh, Mia Knox. What do you got here, Mia? Let me see what you got. I said the same thing about not looking at their titles. Instead, I would say to myself that they put on their pants on the same way. Yeah, see, you're much nicer than I am. See, I just look at them on the toilet, right? That just helped me. But yeah, they, everybody puts on their pants the same way. And so I think it's interesting because I think as salespeople, you gain this power by not looking at titles. I can't tell you. I mean, I, I wish you can just jump into my head and see these images in my head of all these situations I have been in where once I ignored their title, I was able to kind of like get past the title and actually have great conversations with them. And I think that helped accelerate a lot of deals because of that. So keep that in mind. Uh, Jared, didn't think of that, cool. And then uh, Brian's back with, experience has its benefit, 1964. Ah, that's right, that's right, you tell him Brian, you tell him Brian, that was for you Shrew Tesh. All right, so number five, cruising this real quick. All right, so this is where you have to kind of be a little creative. Remember, it's all about creativity. They need to find ways to reduce money and budget or, you know, reduce budget without simply offering a discount. So this is important. I, I, I love this one because I go, too often we think selling is giving a discount. No, that's, not, that's giving money away. Remember the, um, the, the, the quote by uh, Mac Hannon, that discounting is the ignorance tax you pay for not knowing the value of your product. Discount is the inner ignorance tax you pay for not knowing the value of your product. Now, again, I always like to highlight this. It's, I'm not saying never discount. Discount wisely. But at the same time, keep in mind that it may not be the discount what they're looking for. They're looking for certainty, reduced anxiety. One of the things I like about you know, a reduced budget is being able to talk to them about, oh, well, let's figure this out. You know you need to do something. You're in the acceptance phase, right? You've accepted things are going to change. You got the fifth level. Boom, I've accepted. You got to move forward. So my question to you is, what are you offering them? When they say, I don't have the budget, what do you have in your back pocket to go, Phew, here's what I got, right? What do you have? If you don't have anything, you're screwed. The conversation stops right there. So my question to you is, if you're selling today and someone says, I don't have the budget, Victor, I don't have the budget. What do you do? What do you say to them? My question to you is, what should you be offering them? I know you got something. We all have something we can offer them. You ever hear the foot in the door strategy? The foot in the door strategy. So the foot in the door, you smell like this. This is the acronym. Foot in the door strategy. The foot in the door strategy is simply when you try to get in something small, 
like get them to buy something small so you can sell them something big later on, right? That's the foot. Think of putting your foot in the door, right? Get something in there and then expand it. As someone would say, you land and you expand. So what foot in the door strategy do you have? What foot in the door strategy do you have? In other words, if you're trying to sell them this big box, why not sell them a small box just to get them started? That's your foot in the door. By the way, great strategy if you're trying to take business away from your competitor, right? But what is your foot in the door strategy? That's why I want you to think about this. So when we talk about this one right here, you know, think about what is your foot in the door strategy? How can you be creative? When they say they have a budget issue, what is your foot in the door strategy? What do you got for them? How can you help them? That's what I want you to tell me. What do you guys got here? Uh, okay, a lot of people tell me when they were born. I love this. Uh, Inkle loves the shirt, man. Action is king, and it really is, man. It was a great gift, man. Uh, so again, think of what is, if I say to you right now, oh, I don't have the budget, what's your comeback? Type it in. Tell me what your comeback is. Type it in in the comment section. Type it in, comment section, wherever that, wherever it's at, type it in, what's your comeback? If I said, nah, you know what, I don't have that big of a budget. What do you got? And again, it could be something that's phased in. Instead of selling them the whole package, you're selling them part of the package. If, they, if you just wanna sell them a service, start out with something simple that they can afford. If you're selling coaching services, instead of selling a monthly package, maybe you sell you know, a once a month package, right? Instead of getting together every month, week, or every week, you get together once. What do you have? So, let me see, I got, we got a couple down here. Uh, we have, let me see, uh, let me see, Whitworth Automotive Policy. Can you shout out to my wife, Shelly? She has started her own copywriting business. I told her to subscribe and she will be watching this later today. Shelly, by the way, my wife's name is Shelly and is actually spelled the same way with an E-Y, not making that up. Shelly, good luck with the business. You're gonna do well. I hope you're watching this and then watch the other live streams as well. So shout out, there you go, how's that? Good hubby, you got a good hubby there. Uh, let me see, Al Gonzalez says, I sell granite and quartz and I get a lot of people with budget issues. What do you got from Al? Tell me what you got from Al. I know we got, look, I get the pushback. Everybody gets pushback. Al, I'm pushing you now. What are you coming back with? How can we be more creative? What is your budget? Great question. But if, and again, if it's a small budget, what do we do? When selling Mark Construction Services, Leon Daly, again, what do we got? I want, I, what do you got? You can start with a smaller package for starters. Grand Flyer Expert, absolutely. Uh, we sell beauty products, Aisha. Then what do you say to them, Aisha? Come on, Aisha. I'm in the home, whole improvement business and I offer to do it in stages. There you go, Jorge Ferrer, right? So love it. It's, again, it could be just now stages. Let's, again, trial runs. Uh, let's look at what the least numbers are, right? Let's look at some numbers. Let's figure out what works. Because maybe there'll be extended payments or extended contracts, whatever, give me something, or shorter term contracts, whatever it is. Because you know what happens when people come back to you and they, and again, when you give them options and sometimes when you just get that foot in the door, right? You just get them to let's sign a lease for six months, Brenda. You know what's gonna happen. Business is gonna start probably going up in six months and now they're yours because they're gonna re-up on the lease, right? So whatever we can do, look, pennies add up. Listen to me, people, pennies add up. A thousand bucks here, 500 bucks there, 5,000 there, 20 bucks there, it all adds up. And I think that's the mindset we have to have. I'm not saying drop your price, get rid of your structure, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if I'm selling B2B, Guess what? I used to sell a lot of $20,000 programs. I'm gonna sell a lot of 5,000. I know I gotta sell more, but that's just the way it is, right? If I'm selling small products, $100 products, well, maybe I gotta sell some $20, $25 products to build up. Again, how does it add up? What I've been doing is creating multiple streams of income. Why well, I already had a few streams of income, but I just added a few more. So I love your thinking, right? I love your thinking. Uh, Pete says, do I coach? Absolutely, Pete. I got, I got five coaching clients right now. If you go to my website, just go to victorantonio.com. You can see the details there. Come on, man. Join the coaching program. I think you'll love it. Uh, it's an annual program, but what I tell people is, you know, you pay monthly, and then when you say we're done, we're just done. 
when you've learned. My job is not to keep you on the coaching program, it's to kick you off, to get you in and then kick you off, just like the Sales Velocity Academy. Same deal, man. So thanks for asking, man. Love to have you, man. Uh, let me see, where am I at here? So Jorge got you. We sell beauty products. Uh, Ronald, there's an outbreak. No budgets they maintain. Help me out with that. Give me more information. I meant home improvement. I know you did. I know you did. I know you did. Uh, let me see. A lot of times the lease numbers are small increases. Look at the lease numbers, not the whole number. Yeah, sometimes you just have to break it down in small chunks. It's how you present price as well. Again, what we're just trying to do is come up with creative ways. Look, I get it. Some of you are in, in the comment section are typing in, but Victor, they just don't have the money. They just don't have the money. Somebody has budget. Listen to me. Somebody has budget. It's not like nobody has budget. Somebody has budget. If, all, if you talk to 100 people and they all say they don't have any budget, you're talking to the wrong people. you got a marketing problem, okay? That's a marketing problem. But if you're talking to your ideal clients, right, they're probably going to have budgets. If you're talking to the right people, they have budgets. They don't have this much, but they got that much. And I'll take that much anytime, especially during these times, right? Uh, if someone tells me they don't have the budget, it's either they're not interested or they really don't have the budget. Which is it? Cheryl, you passed the test, right? So when somebody says they don't have the budget, and again, I love the way you're, you shifted my I'll think about it strategy. When somebody tells me I'll think about it, it's usually they're not interested or they're interested but not sure. Which one is it? So when somebody says they don't have the budget, you got to find a way to ask. And I love the way that what you brought that up because you got to find a way to ask that question, right? When you say you don't have a budget, I can say, are you talking you have zero dollars or you don't have sufficient a sufficient budget? Which one is it? Right? Because there's a big difference between zero and insufficient. And if they say, no, no, we have budget, we just, it's insufficient. And then now my follow-up is going to be, well, what do you mean by insufficient? Because maybe I have something I can offer you for that insufficient budget. So I'm glad you brought that up, Cheryl. Thank you very much. Awesome, man. Uh, well, what can you afford, right? Uh, Sam says, if I could, I'd help them raise money and get the budget. Clever, man. By the way, this it this this deserves like you know. Let me see. I, I gotta get. I gotta. I gotta give you the DJ horn. Buddy. This is this is so out of the box right here. This is this is what I love because it's not gonna work for everybody. But this is interesting. What Sam is saying here because sometimes they don't have the sufficient budget, but if they talk to other departments, they can pool their money together and come up with a budget. Right, and so maybe we can find ways to create these co-ops, these cooperatives within companies or organizations, and people can pool their money together. What a great thought, man! Thank you for bringing that up, Sam. That's amazing. I love that. I, I totally forgot about that option. That's a great one. Elkin, I offer them an expandable system that can upgrade later on, and that way they get started with their security system. There it is. As long as it's upgradable, you know, expandable, you know, uh, integratable, that's all. It's just something small. What you're trying to do is get that small feel front. A security system with, let's say, let's say the basic bells and whistles, no pun intended, you know, let's say cost, I'm going to say just throwing a number out because I don't know what they really cost, like 30 bucks a month. Well, as the economy starts turning, then I can start layering some services on there. Remember, the easiest customer to sell to is the one you got. This is why the foot in the door strategy, just trying to sell them something, is a great strategy. Because once you sold them something, you've already established your credibility. That means when you want to sell them something up, upsell, cross sell, that means your sales cycle is going to be shorter, but also the credibility is already there. You already sold them something. So that's why I'm saying, let's be creative. Let's see if we can get them in. Or in, our, in this case, let's see if we can get our foot in the door and sell them something. Thank you for that one. That was awesome, man. I appreciate that. Uh, where are we at right here? Elkin, I got a lot of scrolling going on. If I missed your comment, don't get mad. Just retype it in, okay? I got a lot of comments scrolling. Uh, by the way, you guys, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I got feeds coming in from Facebook, my Facebook personal, my Facebook fan page, uh, YouTube, and Twitch. So I'm seeing four different streams come in. So if I miss yours, it's not on purpose. It's just, there's a lot to look at right here. What are you paying in your budget now? What are you paying in your budget now, right? Ask some questions. Let's get some numbers on the table, right? Leon, what you got? When selling my construction, if they say they can't manage the budget, I will find out what they can manage and see if it can work for both of us. And a long process, uh, August, everything can work. Yeah, I mean, find a way to make it work, man. See, that's... Leon, that's the attitude right there. Let's find, let's do something. 
Let's we you and I are in this together, man. Let's do something. Right? We can't yeah, action is king. Let's do something. We just can't sit around and do nothing. Imagine you talking to your customers like that. Do you think, going back to my earlier bullet point about giving them courage, do you think you're giving them some? So look, you and I both know that we both have to do something to keep our business going and growing. We can't stop. It's like a shark. You can't stop, right? They got to keep swimming to stay alive. So same thing. We got to keep swimming to stay alive. I don't know if I'd use the shark analogy though. But anyway, let me get to the next one real quick. I got two more that can just wrap up. We can answer some more questions. Six. The last two are very basic, but I think very important. And we also forget. And again, Credit goes to James Mankey, who wrote this article, and I just love these points. Number six, continue to nurture relationships even if the prospect is reluctant to buy right now. Ooh, this is a good one. You know why? Because you know when somebody doesn't buy from you, you're like, ah, you know, and you, waste, you, you say, I wasted all this time on them. But keep in mind that there are certain realities that some people simply can't afford it. They just simply have no budget. There might be a situation where they don't have budget, but yet they're still a good client or a potentially good client. And so this is why having a CRM, by the way, keeping track of your clients, even when they don't buy, let's stay close to them. But what does that mean, stay close to them? What does that mean, nurture the relationship? What if, I'm assuming you have a CRM, um, and by the way, so by the way, I just FYI, side note, uh, I think by the time I'm, I'm doing my next, uh, we start in August, I'll have my first sponsor for the Sales After Dark program and it's gonna be a CRM company. Yeah, so anyway, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm really excited about the announcement. August, Victor Antonio, Sales After Dark, will have his first sponsor, and I'll probably have a second one by the end of that month also. So what I, what, if you have a CRM, you're able to track who you visit. You create these cadences. You know what I mean by cadences? How often you reach out. And so again, if I met with a client, they don't have the budget, then I could set up some cadences. You know, what, what type of information do I send out just to stay in touch with them? Maybe every month I'll mail them something, maybe more a personalized message, or maybe every two months I'll pick up the phone and call them. Put that into my CRM, right? Stay close to them. I, I can't emphasize, this is hard by the way, because when they don't buy, right? It's like when they don't buy from you, it's like wah, 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 right? You just wanna break up. Right? You just want to break up. You're like, ah, screw you. Right? Ah, screw you. You know, if you don't want to buy it because you've invested time, they don't have the money. But I, but I think you have to shift that brain and just say, you know what? I'm not going to get mad anymore. I'm just going to say, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with these people? Right? But I want to stay close to them, man. I want to nurture them. I want to hold them. I want to hug them. I want to squeeze them. Stay close, but figure out how you're going to do it with the system because it's hard to remember who you touch, who you didn't touch, right? In terms of sending emails out, phone calls, and so forth. So, uh, if you're using a CRM, hit me up with what type of CRM are you using? Is it Salesforce? Is it Pipedrive? Is it HubSpot? What are you using? Is it Zoho? I'd like to know what you're using, but I think this one's important. This one's important that you got to figure out. Don't take it personal. Too often we take it personal. When somebody doesn't buy, it's like, ah, you know, we take it personal, we get mad. But remember that first one about taking their point of view, trying to understand them. Remember, they're scared. They're scared. And maybe the reason they're saying no to you has nothing to do with you. In fact, if you think about rejection, in many cases, unless you're a jerk, right? It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with their insecurity or their inability to believe what you're saying, all right? But when somebody doesn't buy from you, again, let's try to be a little empathetic, take their point of view and not get mad. And so, short story here, I think you'll like this. The, man, it's hot in my studio here for some reason. Maybe because I'm in Georgia right now. I said, I'm working too hard for you guys, man. I'm working too hard. So I have a client, uh, one of my coaching clients. Uh, I won't tell you his name, so you won't, I'm not divulging any personal information. But one of the things that we had to get over, this was interesting, and I, even I learned from it, is that when his customers weren't being forthright with him, does that ever happen to you? When your customer's not being forthright with you, right? He, he was taking it as a personal insult that it was about, that it they were like disrespecting him. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, when they, when they lie to me and they don't tell me the truth, it's like they don't respect me. I go, what? <laughs> and he said, no. And so I want you to listen to this. This is important. Like zoom in, get close to your screen here. If you get what I'm about to say, it could change your sales career. I'm not joking. What I told him was this. I said, you don't understand. When people lie, or lie by omission, don't tell you everything, or 
obfuscate or seem a little opaque, right? Did I use every word I could there? A little obtuse about their response, right? A little evasive, right? When they do these things and they're not direct, it's not because they're disrespecting you. It's because they themselves are insecure or scared. Think about that for a second. See, sometimes you think a client lies to you because they're trying to get over on you, they don't respect you, they don't see you as smart. That whole bit. No, they're doing that because they're insecure. Like when people want to negotiate price all the time, some people just want to negotiate because they feel they need to feel that power of, I got something from Victor that he wasn't going to give me. I got an extra 5%. And they're like, oh, 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 oh. They're like King Kong, right? You're like, what the hell, right? Because what's happening there, what you're seeing there is that they're insecure. They're literally insecure that they feel that they need to win. They need to get something from you. That for some reason makes them feel better. Let them, right? But I am saying it's, it has nothing to do with you. And that's why I had to tell them. It has nothing to do with you. And so when somebody rejects you, it has nothing to do with you. Now, unless you have a horrible presentation, like you just didn't present the value, then it has everything to do with you. But assuming that you delivered the product presentation correctly, it was a great meeting, and they don't buy, maybe you missed something, but at the end of the day, it's not you. Now, I'm not trying to say don't take any personal accountability or responsibility for your sales ability. Of course, you got to be good at what you do. But when people don't tell you the truth, when they hide their, their real feelings or the real data or the real information, don't share it with you, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with their insecurity. You know what I mean? So keep that in mind. And by the way, this works for personal relationships too. Sometimes when you're dealing with somebody and they're not being honest with you, it has nothing to do with you. It has, it has everything to do with their insecurity and how they look in your eyes. They're afraid to tell you the truth because they don't want to look bad in your eyes. Now, you may take it as a sign of disrespect. Why did she lie to me? Why did he lie to me? It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with their inability to actually be truthful. You know what I mean? So keep that in mind. I mean, it's an important lesson to learn. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Last but not least, number seven, and then we'll just take some questions. Last one, I put a teddy bear on this one because I think this is important. This is obvious. Pay attention to your existing clients. Pay attention to your existing clients because this is important. Because what I just said earlier, look, uh, so I know I've said this already a couple of times. Uh, so I wrote a book called Upselling is New Prospecting. I've yet to release it, I know. Uh, and there's something in me that says I'm now ready to release it, right? So I think within the next month, I'll have the book released. And upselling is all about how do you sell to your existing client base. And studies have shown, depending on which one you read, that you can increase your revenue by up to 30% by just selling to your existing client base. Think about that for a second. Think about that. You can sell to your existing client base. 30% you can increase your revenue. Said another way, if you're, if you're generating a million, that's another, an extra $300,000 you can generate. If you're selling 10 million, that's an extra 3 million you can generate. So there's a lot of money there to be had. Right? So let's sell to our existing customer. Let's pay attention to them. Kind of like point number six, let's nurture the relationship even if they don't buy. But let's really nurture the relationship. Let's get this in the CRM. Let's get the cadences going. Cadence being how often I reach out and touch them. Get this in a CRM so we're reaching out and making sure we're touching the right people. And those are my seven bullet points for tonight's Sales After Dark. Let me know what you think, man. On a scale of one to 10, let me know what you think. By the way, if you like this, uh, I gotta always remind people, can you do me a favor? Can you hit the like button down there or wherever it is, right? And then share it with at least one other person. That's all I ask, man. If you could just share this with at least one other person, love it, man. So uh, anyway, I'm loving this community, by the way. So I've been doing this now. This is Sales After Dark number 41. I've done 41 of these. And so, you know, for those of you who've been with me from the beginning, I kinda know who you are. I wanna thank you for, you know, stay, stick it with me on the journey, man. And for those of you coming on board, man, thank you, man. Uh, it's, it's really cool to be here with you guys. I hope you guys are enjoying this content. I really try to find things, you know, or highlight things that are uh, a little different than what everybody else is presenting without getting too much detail. Let me just erase that, hold on a second. But anyway, so anyway, let me know how you're enjoying this, the content. And I'm always open to suggestions on something you want me to cover. 
Uh, and, you know, like I said, I got some other stuff I want to share with you just a bit here. Uh, let me just, I'm going to scroll to the bottom. Uh, my man put payment options. Jared, Jared, I know I owe you an email slash call. I got it. Um, payment options get a good response as an alternative, right? Payment options are always great. And again, if I missed yours, don't be mad at me. Uh, rental or rent to buy? Boom, Duncan. Way to go, man. Way to go. Al Gonzalez, back in the house. When it comes to budget issues, I do tell them about the cheaper granite, but they don't like the cheaper granite. They like the level three and four granite. Now, on that one, out, it's all about positioning. See, that's how you move them up, right? So, look, I can, I can sell you something cheaper. I said, but, you know, and let them make a decision. So, we'll have to do something on pricing, man. I'm going to do, I'm gonna do a, a whole series on pricing again. Uh, you should watch the last one I did where I touched on, you know, how to present pricing out. So, if you didn't see the last live stream, you know, you should check it out. Uh, zero interest EMI is likely most, e like most e-commerce companies do. Perfect, man. Inkle, you've been quiet, man. What do you think is the best industry today that salespeople should jump into? I get this question all the time, Inkle. It's just like, it's such a hard one for me to uh, judge right now because, you know, like I said, the, some of the most unexpected industries are doing well. The pool industry being the one I keep highlighting, roofing through the roof, uh, getting contractors to come to your house. I mean, who would have thought that people now will start investing money in their actual homes? Uh, so these are all great businesses to jump into. Uh, and so I would start there. I mean, it's just so hard. I would just ask around and just, you know, keep my antennas up. There's so many. I would start is, why don't you do this, Inkle? This, if this question's for you, what I would do, Inkle, is I said, you know, what are two or three things I like doing? And then I would pick those two or three things that I like doing. And then I would explore industries where I can sell those two or three things and then see how they're doing. That's how I would do it. I would reverse engineer this whole process, man. Let me know what you think of that. Uh, I got to pop my glasses on for this one, man. I got Brenda. Brenda, okay. Let's start working with the traffic you already have on your website and get you a better conversion rate and turn them into good leads. She's a saleswoman. That woman is a saleswoman right there, man. Uh, man, I'd love to have you, Pete, man. I'd love to have you. Herb Wash. Sometimes we will fit product into a budget if customer can afford us a service. Uh, offer us a service, especially in areas where we aren't great at, for example, marketing graphic. Uh, graphics. So in other words, are you talking bartering here? I think you're talking bartering here. So, I mean, again, another creative approach, right? So if you're talking bartering, boom, you get the applause, man. Because again, that is thinking out of the box. I think that was number five. Think out of the box, right? That OTB. How do you think out of the box? Come up with something creative and maybe bartering might be a situation. Uh, I had a company who decided to do co-op advertising. So they got together with another company that doesn't sell a competitive product, but sells a complimentary product. And then they split the advertising revenue or uh, uh, cost there. So that's another way of doing it. So I love that, man. That's a great way of doing it. I trust to frame what they already spend on water related costs as their budget and break down to a Coke a day cost. So in other words, what they call it, we re reduce it to the ridiculous, right? You start dividing and saying, okay, if you really think about it, this is how much it's really costing you per day. Uh, and I love, Jared's with me on this one, Matt. There's always a budget. There's always some budget, right? You just got to find it. But again, keep in mind that whole thing about that, that cooperative budget, like going to other departments and putting pooling money together, or the one I just gave you about co-ops, joining together, selling complimentary products. Imagine you, you let's say uh, I do sales coaching, right? And training, right? Now I go to a technology company that actually sells a technology products that helps salespeople. What if I just partnered with them and said, hey, you know, we both need to advertise, but you know, we have minimal budget. Why don't we split the cost and just budget, our, you know, put something together that pushes us both or something like that. So I think that's a creative approach, man. I like that, Jared. Thank you, man. Uh, either offer lower price package or place value add on the product with the same price. Absolutely. And again, if they don't have the budget, they'll go with the lower price, which is fine. You know, it's true. Somebody has a budget. They always have a budget, man. They always have a budget. Hot head, fat head. They always have a budget, hot head. Blake Poo. How do you, how do you pronounce, Blake, how do you pronounce your last name? Can you put it phonetically in the thing? Is it Blake Poo? Uh, if they don't have the budget, build one for them to, uh, them be the buyer and the seller. I mean, that right there, man. Now, let me tell you why, why I think that's brilliant. Because 
Imagine that you tell the customer, they say, well, we, you know, we really don't have a budget. And you say, well, let's put one together right now. And then imagine for a moment, maybe this is where Blake's going. Imagine for a moment that I said, look, let's say that this is a whole year. We got 12 months, right? Whatever it is, all the way down to 12 months. And usually your budgets are, I'm just going to make a number up, a thousand bucks a month. Eh. So what do we do is what we'll start out with, why don't we just start out with a hundred bucks for the first month, ramp up. And by the time we hit the, we'll hit 600. By the time we get to the end of the year, we'll be at a thousand bucks, whatever it may be. You know what I mean? And then we gradually move into this budget. How does that work for you, Mr. Customer? I love that. That is presenting a solution and giving them something to go, hmm, let me think about that. Because now, see, a lot of people may be, may be embarrassed to say, I, I can't afford $1,000. I can't afford $1,000. But if you say, well, let me build a budget for you, and you say, now you drop $100, they're like, Oof, I can afford that. But see, they wouldn't tell you that because they're afraid. Again, remember, it's not you sometimes. It's their insecurity. And some people would be too embarrassed to say, I can't even afford a thousand. The only thing I have is a hundred bucks. They don't want to say it, but if you said it for them, totally different game changer. That right there, Blake, champion man. That right there is champion man. Who has my money? <laughs> That's right. <coughs> Who has my money, right? So let me get rid of this. Uh, what do we got? Uh, Cardone says, who's got my money? Our job is to find out who has the budget and how to position our value over cost. Every time. It, it, it's, it's who has my money. I love Grant when he says that. Who has my money? But the thing is, there's always, again, money can't be static. It just doesn't sit. And if it sits, it doesn't sit there for long. So keep that in mind. So it's always moving. Uh, I think experience like you can beat anyone any day. I think so, man. It's, we'll work it, man. I can meet you halfway if it makes sense, if it's a good fit. You get the idea. You get the idea. Uh, oh, Robin said, oh, what is, oh, I forgot to say, it was out of the box thinking, Matt. Sorry, Robin. I just realized afterwards I didn't mention that. OTP. That means you're paying attention, though, Robin, so thank you very much. Anyway, I need to start wrapping this thing up, man. We've been on here over an hour. And so uh, in the next one, I think I'm going to cover, I got something, Matt. Uh, I'm going I'm to, this is like a preview. So I'm reading this book. ABM is B2B, right? ABM is B2B. And dude, I've, 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 this is my second time going through the book. And what's interesting about this book, this is like the future of sales and marketing. This is the future of sales and marketing. And so I'm going to be covering that book. I think I may do it in the next one. If not, I'll do it uh, in two uh, live streams from now. But you're going to want to check this out. Uh, it's really a book about how do you market in today's world where you can't get a hold of decision makers, you can't find the right people, and they won't return your phone calls. This book, uh, let me go through it. Uh, if you want to buy it ahead of time, go ahead and buy it ahead of time. It's worth the money. I'm just telling you right now, it's worth the money. Uh, and check it out, and then I'll be covering and going through that. But if you're into B2B and you're into marketing, but I think you can even, if you're B2C, it still applies. You can still use it. So that'd be kind of cool. So on that note, I don't think I have anything else. I did want to share something with you. My, my son, I got a son, and my son's always on me about, he says, you know, people want to know sometimes what you do as a hobby or something. And I think I've mentioned to you guys, that I tell you I make pens, right? So I'm going to see if I can do this. So you ever see my pens? So I make pens. So I got this whole, like, machinery set up down there. So let me see, let me see if I can find this slide. I'm, I'm going to skip to a slide here. Bear with me. Bear with me. I'm going somewhere. So there... So these are pens I make. So that's the pen you're looking at. Yeah? And that's my hobby. So I make pens, and I love carving these things. And so what I do with these pens, I make these pens. It takes about an hour and a half, maybe two hours to cut one of these. Uh, and sometimes I blow them up. Like you, 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 if you gouge the thing, it just blows up. Not blows up like explosion, but, you know, it just comes apart. And so I know Pen, sales guy, right? Makes total sense. I didn't plan it that way. But one of the things I'm telling people now is that during this pandemic, it's like we need something to like, you know, detach ourselves from our daily lives. And so I throw that out there as a, if you don't, if you have a hobby, great. If you don't have a hobby, you should get a hobby. Anyway, as I close out with my final thoughts, here are my final thoughts for the day. First of all, you know how to do this. Like, subscribe, share that whole thing down here. Do that. So keep in mind that as we're selling in this new normal, I think you need to have more of the direct conversations. That's what I would say. The direct conversations being, let's talk about budget. 
But also, let me take your point of view. Let me try to understand where you're coming from. But as you guys have also mentioned, and I've talked about a little bit, is let's come to the table with some options, things that they can use, right? Suggestions for payment options, right? Foot in the door strategies, right? Things that we can help them to reduce their anxiety and say, well, let's just start out really small. And then keep in mind the last two points, which I think were very important. Even if somebody doesn't buy from you, let's stay in touch. Even if they don't buy from you, find your cadence, your rhythm to stay in touch with them. And if they are buying from you, point number seven, let's show them some extra love, man. Reach out to them. And again, through upselling or cross-selling, you can increase your revenue by 30%. And if you do that, that'd be fantastic. So before I leave, remember, subscribe here to the channel. Hit that little bell right there. So you'll be alerted when I go on. And then check out the Sales Velocity Academy where I got all my courses. So if you love this content, you'll really like what's in the Sales Velocity Academy. On that note, my sales after dark peeps, I got to go. This is Victor Antonio, always reminding you, selling ain't hard when you know how. Take care, man.